Mark, uh, you've spent significant uh, part of your life um, in education, trying to introduce the more creative ways of how to teach the young people skills necessary for the 21st century. Can you tell a bit more about what you do and more importantly, why do you think that works? <laughs> well, thank you very much, Aram. I'm very happy to be here. Well, when we talk about learning, especially 21st century learning, we have to focus not on facts, but on skills. So these are the two basic types of knowledge human beings have, knowledge of facts, knowledge of skills. And the thing is that the way that we learn skills is through practice, through doing it. So you cannot learn how to swim by only watching YouTube videos. You, know, you, you do that, you jump in the deep end, that's not swimming, that's well-informed drowning. So the problem right. is that in order to educate for the 21st century, we have to adopt methods which go back to what all of us, as our common sense, know is the correct way. Namely, we use experiences. And the most effective and impactful experiences are going to be those which, well, are fun, engaging, absorbing. And if we craft the experiences so that there's also a learning point, then what we find is that there's genuine learning which is transferable across domains. So in a nutshell, in the doing is the learning, right? Right. So then comes the second question from the uh, experienced educator, which is how do you make sure the skills has been learned? Because mm. uh, that's one of the challenges, especially if we talk about so-called soft skills, yes. kinds of skills that nobody knows how okay. to measure. Okay, well, let me do a selfless plug at this point, because we actually, uh, my organization, and, and I created what is effectively the world's first online game-based assessment for 21st century skills. It was validated together with the Max Planck Institute. Does it have any name to it? <laughs> Yes, as you can see, not much of a salesman. Uh, Mirme, M-I-R-M-E. So okay. if one looks at mirme.net, one sees it. Okay, okay, fine. But no, thank you. Well, that's uh, because <laughs> some, some of our viewers might be genuinely interested. Well, thank can you. Assume. Thank you. And the trick is basically this. Imagine you have to assess skills for playing soccer, right? and maybe you are a teacher of students. And I, I saw on the way into this lovely school, I, I actually saw your students playing soccer. Now, if you are the coach of your school soccer team and you have a friendly match at the beginning of the, of, of the school year, and then you practice, 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 and then you have a match at the end, well, imagine that you scored against your opponent for the first friendly match 2-2. Mm -hmm. And then you practice, you develop your skills, you know that your players have gotten better. You know as the coach that they've improved. But you only then ask at the end, oh, what your result is from the second or terminal friendly match, it's still 2-2. Traditional assessment would only tell you, oh, there's no improvement. <laughs> so in order for assessment in soccer, it's like, the same thing we're going to apply for 21st century skills, we have to find what would be the moments where you see how people are making decisions. So what Mirmi is, is it's a heuristic-based learning system uh, adopting uh, Gigerenzer's idea of fast and frugal heuristics for decision-making. And the idea is by watching how people make decisions in a game, it's just a simple strategy game, you can actually figure out how they're making their decisions. You can see, mm -hmm. I'm drawing on this cognitive resource or that cognitive resource. At the end of the day, it's all about making decisions. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So 
besides making decisions uh, or communication, alongside with making decisions, mm -hmm. one of the this is one of the key skills of the modern people should be synthesizing knowledge from different sources, yes. learning from different sources, and being able to draw from these different sources. What, what is the capacity of your approach in that sense? Okay, well, I think that the key for learning any skill to a degree that really is a minimum uh, is we have to be able to apply that skill in analogously similar circumstances. So if one learns to swim, you can swim in a pool, but then you can swim in a lake, in a river, and in, in the ocean. In a desert as well. Well, <laughs> potentially. Uh, yeah, yeah, if potentially, you want to really go to, into creative mm, mode. Yeah. I, I'd say that's probably better surfing, but yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. I mean, it, that's exactly right. It's exactly right. So can you find the, the hooks, the connections into other aspects of your life? We not only do assessment, we teach, as I say, using games. Uh, in Armenia, we actually see this as well. It's very useful because Armenia is unique and you know, makes my heart happy uh, here because uh, I was brought here uh, with the help of the Chess Scientific Research Institute over at uh, ASPU. And the beautiful thing is in Armenia, as I'm sure some of your viewers know, the students undergo chess as a subject for three years. Yeah, I, I, as a former head of a school, <laughs> I knew about that. <laughs> well, um, my deepest apologies, yes, and uh, I'm sure. And the fascinating thing is that by having chess, you actually focus on a number of transferable skills if the chess program is put into a proper context. So for instance, clearly in chess, uh, just to draw a decision-making connection, it is important to identify options and then plan ahead, mm -hmm. right? Well, this same thing will stand your learners in good stead even in the future because that's what your CFOs, your chief financial officers do all the time. They basically have to figure out, well, what's our strategy going forwards? We have these resources. We can, you know, when they, you deploy them for this project and you roll over into that project. As a matter of fact, uh, on Mirmi, there is a component which is about effectively uh, uh, know what you can do, which is identify skills and I mean, identify paths and make choices. CFOs do, in fact, uh, score highest on that component and different skills that we can teach our children go all the way up from there. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, in Singapore, which is where, uh, for the better part of 30 years, uh, I've been located and working with the Ministry of Education there, you would see that just playing through my program, we also have an intervention program uh, under Logic Mills, we basically help uh, prepare all the students who represent Singapore on PISA, all right? Uh, we also are in a large number of schools over there now. And the thing is that, importantly, being able to play a game well and understand what you are doing works like this. You could say, well, you're playing the game, great, when you're playing the game, you use that idea, that concept, that skill, and you ask the student, so where are you using the skill? Oh, right here in the game. So now they have a well-grounded example. And then you ask them the most important question, which is, great, you now have an understanding of what it is you're trying to learn, and you have a grounded example of it. Now I ask you, where else in your life can you do this? Can you do this? And the students are the ones who come up with the applications. They will, you have to listen and maybe listen to the crickets for a while as in the background you're waiting for a response to that question, but eventually the students start pouring in with all different ways they see that skill or something analogous, which is already moving very much in the right direction. They see how that skill makes a difference. 
that even though you're playing a game and not preparing for any specific subject like mathematics, science, literature, what have you, we have done one of the largest and most rigorous studies ever in uh, creative, excuse me, in uh, critical thinking globally uh, with the help of the Ministry of Education in Singapore. It was like a $1.09 million multi-year million data point collection by hand in those days. And uh, <laughs> the thing is, it made a 16.8% or more difference between trained and untrained in 30 hours or less spread over an entire calendar year. Mm -hmm. That's on national high stakes exams in Singapore, uh, as well as showing up on things like O levels and A levels within the British, the Cambridge system. Mm -hmm. So even though you're not teaching to the subject and you're not teaching to the test, by developing the skill, the students do empirically transfer the knowledge and they do it knowingly. Okay, perfect. So now I want to, now I want to touch upon a very different topic. And we've discussed before this um, mm -hmm. uh, shooting that during the COVID, we faced mm. a significant problem as educators. This limited access of uh, students to the schooling in general, mm -hmm as a process, mm -hmm. but also the limited access of teachers to their children, which also limited their ability to engage children right. in learning. So then people started to talk much more about games. Like um, I've talked before that, I've, on one of the conferences, I saw Passy Salberg, he was going around the world advocating for games, and nobody would understand him, frankly. The COVID started and everything was shut down. People started to be getting very interested in how this right. whole gaming idea works because they understood that you can find the child on the other end if you play with the child. Correct. So how this will work out um, in the future? And, and as you said, there are still, from your point of view, the negative influences of COVID in Armenia. How do you think that that can be solved with your approach? Okay. It boils down to the following, right? We have to first see why there is this impact. It's very simple. If what happens is I talk to maybe, uh, you know, a thousand different principles during COVID <laughs> and everybody had the same response. It was, well, it's a challenging time let's just have our teachers do the best they can and when the students return the teachers will get them caught up mm -hmm. how do we do that well it's very simple what happened globally is everybody did their best and teachers and students really we, we came through the difficulty quite well uh, you know all things considered but the problem arose when the students returned to school. What happens? Well, to get somebody caught up means you cover more material in less time. The fancy word for that is cramming. <laughs> and so what happens is students who were proceeding quite reasonably at the standard pace for your curriculum uh, prior to COVID, when they come back, if you have your bell curve of student abilities, those students, unfortunately, start falling behind. And the students who are down this tail, the weaker students, they just fall right off the cliff. So what you have is a general shift. Uh, students, of course, the gifted and talented ones, like, oh, I don't know, you were when you were younger. <laughs> they come through just fine, right? You could probably even speed up the curriculum for those folks. But, from a population standpoint, you create this really sad elephant. <laughs> and that means that there's a problem. What happens then is that learning deficits compound over time. I could go more into detail. I have a few articles on this and you can, we can talk about it later. But the basic idea is that 
what we have to do is work with, again, games. I would say that the answer is not go to the teachers and say, do not do that. That doesn't work. <laughs> that does not work. Paradoxically, the right answer is to actually increase very slightly the demand on the student's time. What the students need are the skills of learning to learn. They need to be able to have a well-equipped set of skills that permit them to handle the deluge of information that's coming down. And I would say that there are three baskets of skills that are very, very important as part of post-COVID recovery. Number one, memory skills, because, well, uh, this is something that has been around very effectively since ancient times and certainly in the Middle Ages, where for thousands of years, we've known how to train a memory to remember things more easily. And if the students have many more facts thrown at them, then by golly, give them something to make it easier to handle and remember. Second, students need skills related to decision making. This may be a sort of mix of concepts and techniques. Like for instance, if we take a look at a student and you say, well, what decisions does the student have to make? Well, if we teach the students things like cost benefit analysis or SWOT analysis, what we're really doing is we are helping the student just put that second in between what they do and thinking about what they do. <laughs> we want that thought to happen. And just having that hesitation to realize that, oh, I, although a student, can make choices and my choices have different consequences, that is very useful. And by cost-benefit analysis, I mean something not just about money, but about things like time. If I do this, I cannot do that, you know, and so on. It's about having the students be aware that they do have significant control over their lives and what they choose matters. And we want them to have tools that help them make better choices. And the third and final basket would be the skills of applied logic. I don't mean, you know, having everybody pull out like Willard Van Orman Quine's like methods of logic. I, I don't mean we have to start doing you know, Principia Mathematica type stuff. I mean applied logic in the sense of being the canons, the rules of reliable thought, okay? And why this is so important is as follows. At the end of the day, all these students will end up having to do things like take tests, whether it is to go into a job or whether it is to enter university or somewhere in their educational process, the selectivity comes in. And the thing is, with COVID happening, where the holes are in the student's factual knowledge will vary even in the same subject, in the same school, different classes. And then you expand that to across a city, a state, and a nation. <laughs> and suddenly you realize there's no consistent body of facts that they all have. Now, when one asks questions, facts are gonna be part of that. Facts are important, you know, they still are. And at that point, we have to ask, well, what do we do for students who have only, when they're faced with a question, they have only touched on that topic very cursorily, or perhaps not even seen it at all. What they need to do is they need to be able to synthesize. They need to be able to extrapolate. And the one thing that will get them there reliably would be these patterns of reliable thinking, basically, as I said, applied logic. Right. Okay, so the last question, unfortunately time flies and we have to really um, take the, the, the notion of time seriously. Um, the last question is, um, teachers. 
in Armenia now, the new curriculum is being introduced. And yes. I've talked to some of the teachers that are uh, trying to get this, a grasp of this new curriculum. And then what they were complaining about is that they were totally unsure if this light and more dynamic teaching that they are required to implement in every day, like involving uh, uh, students into discussions instead of just telling them what to do and telling uh -huh. them all of that, lecturing them, is that will that ultimately give any, any educational result? They just don't believe in that. <laughs> and it, and, and no, no articles, no readings, nothing will make them change their mind right. about their own practice and their own past uh, experience. So mm -hmm. what is your experience in dealing mm -hmm. with teachers and making them play games right. with students in the 10th grade, for instance? <laughs> <laughs> well, what you are describing is exactly what we faced starting in 2005 in Singapore. Uh, we went through all these different stages from initially, oh, if you teach my students, your accent is too difficult for them uh, in, in Singapore, right? Where English is a common language. Yep. Or, uh, you know, all the way through, my teachers do not believe this. Here's the thing, okay? We know that the results are excellent. That really is no longer a scientific question. It's irrational to believe that this is wasted time. It's irrational. And I'm sorry, but they have no leg to stand on that way. Okay. We can talk about how to optimize it. But the way to do this is actually to make the teachers try it. So when, when we are doing teacher training, the actual content is less important than the methodology. And a lot of what we're doing is simply helping the teachers train their eye to recognize what an effective experiential learning lesson looks like. In Singapore, especially when we started, it was rote learning. I mean, this is a post-Soviet educational system here. It's still got a lot of elements in common with Singapore. There was even a similar approach to dealing with COVID between Armenia and Singapore. So there are lots of commonalities. And the interesting thing is that the teachers all resist it, okay? Especially your good teachers who are effective at the lecture, the radio teacher transmitting knowledge to the students. And it's very, very difficult to get somebody to change the way they do something that they've done successfully for decades. Of course. <laughs> However, really the trick is, as we're doing teacher training, we have them role play. We have them model it. And frankly, if you can get teachers to simply try it, they realize, number one, it's extremely rewarding. Number two, it's not at all scary, but the challenges you face are different from the lecture format. You walk into a classroom, you see the students actively talking with each other, talking, for instance, about a game. In Armenia, you, know, you come to the school, you see, it's noisy, oh, this is wrong. Like, no, 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 please, please. With <laughs> they're learning. Well, give them a worksheet. No, 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 no. Right. It's, 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 Please, it's, it's all about practice. It's not wasted time, it's practice. Let the students play. You know, 75 to 80% of an hour class has to be playing the game, not lecturing when you're talking about a specific targeted skill. And so I think that the answer is twofold. Number one, simply give the teachers a safe environment to try it, where they are supported by people who really care about them and who are going to want to, uh, well, their own colleagues want to support them. So do something in a supportive environment. Secondly, tell them that there really is still an important place for their traditional teaching methodology. Honestly, Students should memorize the multiplication table. 
You know, when I was younger, we would do it out to like, you know, maybe 20 times 20. Uh, nowadays, you're lucky if you get to 10 times 10. But at the end of the day, you should just know it. <laughs> and you, you pound that in. That's, that's nothing else. And that's right. We, we need that. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very interesting discussion. Uh, yeah, I think uh, it, it is uh, one thing to know that these things work. It's a very different thing to hear that from a person who does that for the large part of his mm -hmm. life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aram. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you.